Welcome to First Look, Washington Post Live's one-stop shop for news and analysis. I'm Jonathan Capehart, associate editor at The Washington Post. Well, happy days are here again, it seems, for President Biden's re-election campaign. A huge fundraising event in New York City last night with the last two two-term Democratic presidents and poll numbers starting to move in the right direction. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what it all means with Tulu Olorunipa, White House Bureau Chief for The Washington Post. Tulu, welcome back to First Look. Thanks, Jonathan. It's great to be with you again. Uh, so former presidents Clinton and Obama were at the, the big Biden fundraiser last night at Radio City Music Hall, 5,000 people. Uh, a fundraiser the Biden campaign labeled, quote, most, the most successful political fundraiser in American history. And later on, they announced they, they had raised $26 million in that one night. So uh, how did it go? Was it all that? The campaign is really happy about last night's event. They were able to bring together two former uh, presidents, two presidents that both won two terms, as Joe Biden is hoping to do in November and generate enthusiasm, have the party behind Joe Biden, and really take shots at Donald Trump. A lot of what happened over the course of last night, which was moderated by comedian Stephen Colbert, was taking shots at Donald Trump, both on policy and trying to humiliate him and mock him, and really try to generate enthusiasm behind Biden as the Democratic standard bearer. And so Democrats are very happy about the turnout. They're very happy about the money that they raised. They already have a pretty large fundraising edge against Trump. Now, there were a few protesters. We can talk about the protesters that showed up to, to protest Biden over his handling of the war in Gaza. But overall, the campaign is very happy that they have $26 million more million to spend against Trump in the general election. Well, let, since you brought it up, let's, let's uh, um, quickly talk about those protests. I mean, they protesters have um, appeared at every Biden event um, of this election season. What exactly happened? Well, you had hundreds of protesters outside demonstrating against uh, Joe Biden's policy, uh, chanting and clashing with police officers in some cases. But because this was an event that people could get into by paying as little as $20, $225, you also had some people who paid the money for a ticket and then came in and protested during the event while the three presidents were on stage to voice their displeasure with how President Biden has been handling the war in Gaza. Now, Biden was able to address some of those issues on stage. He talked about the need to get more humanitarian assistance into Gaza. He also talked about the threat that Israel remains under with Hamas continuing to exist. And so all the presidents actually were able to talk about how difficult this issue is and how difficult it is to be president and face these kinds of issues behind the Oval Office. And so he did receive uh, you know, a chance of four more years after the protests happened. And so by and large, the crowd was very enthusiastic and, and supportive. But the fact that there were protesters both inside and outside the venue makes it clear that Biden has some work to do to shore up his Democratic base and to make sure that he has the full backing of his party as he gets ready to take on Trump. Right. During, during the protests, President Biden got backup from former President Obama, which highlights, the, you know, among many reasons why the former president is a valuable surrogate, um, the most valuable surrogate a Democratic candidate can have. How else is, is former President Obama making himself available to the Biden campaign? Yeah, I talked to uh, Biden, or, or an Obama advisor yesterday, a little bit about this. They've talked about how Obama has been very instrumental in raising a lot of money for the Biden campaign so far. They've talked about how the fundraising appeals that have President Obama's signature have raised more than $15 million in a, a joint event that they did together, Biden and Obama in December, raised about $3 million. Uh, when it comes to actually campaigning and appearing with Biden, or I've been told not to expect that to happen until we get later in, in the cycle, after the convention in August, after people are paying attention in a more serious way, after people actually have the opportunity to start voting. And the, the, the advisor to Obama essentially said that Obama wants to be useful when he can be helpful. He's going to continue to help Biden raise money. But when it comes to holding campaign rallies or going out and meeting with voters and doing things uh, that are you know, seen as sort of your typical campaigning, we're told not to expect that until later in the cycle when they feel like Obama will be able to move the needle, actually get people out to vote, actually mobilize people while they're paying attention. And so there have been some complaints that you know Obama should be doing more given the threat of Trump. But you know Obama's camp feels that 
deploying him now in a full scale campaign would be a, a, not a good use of anyone's time and it would not help move the needle until we get later in the cycle where people are actually paying attention and starting to vote. Yeah, and, and it would over it would overshadow the sitting president. And to that to that end, you know, when I talked to the president on Air Force One en route to Atlanta about two, two, uh, earlier this month, about three weeks ago tomorrow, I asked I asked him, "You're having a ball, aren't you?" And and he said, "Yes, I could see it on his face. He seems liberated by the campaign and by having Trump as his foil." And you can tell me whether you, you agree with that or not. But uh, last week. Uh, we talked about the huge fundraising advantage Biden has over Donald Trump. This week, you've reported that the fundraising edge has emboldened President Biden to be feistier. So between him looking like he is having a ball on the campaign trail, plus having the huge money advantage he has over Donald Trump, um, there's more than a little pep in his step. Uh, Brother Man is feisty. And we saw some of that feistiness last night and, and the reports that came out of the event, we, we heard that, you know, President Biden challenged former President Trump to a round of golf and said that, you know, the former president should uh, carry his own bags, essentially saying yeah. that, you know, President Trump's ability to, you know, maintain his physical fitness may be, uh, you know, in, in challenge. He also questioned uh, President Trump, former President Trump over, you know, his ideas. He said that his ideas are very old uh, and, uh, and and stale and essentially, you know, reverse these challenges that, that Biden has faced about his age by saying that I may, I may be old, but one, you know, former President Trump is also pretty old. He's 77 and his ideas are old. And I think that's a, a message that you're going to hear uh, over the course of this campaign. Biden trying to take on the issue of age very directly by presenting uh, Donald Trump is someone who wants to return to the ideas of the past, whose ideas are past their prime, and who is not ready for uh, the moment in terms of you know, coming back to the presidency. And so he does seem to be in his element. He does seem to be feisty. He does seem to be you know, taking jabs at Trump more often and, and, and enjoying it and relishing the idea of running against Trump because he beat Trump in 2020 and he feels like he's in a good position to beat him again. You know, um, earlier this morning, the, the Biden campaign released that, that golf joke but Trump carrying his own bag, the, uh, President Biden's golf joke at Donald Trump's expense was released earlier this morning. So, folks, if you go on the interwebs and and search, just search golf joke, you can you can hear it for yourself. It's only about 45 seconds. So, to do one more thing, um, for a campaign that has weathered its share of really bad news, bad polling news, a CNBC poll this week showed President Biden only trailing Trump 46 to 45, that's within the margin of error. Um, but this is the, the poll where Biden trailed by six points in December. So wh what's, what do you think is working for President Biden right now? Well, we have seen some of these polls shift in Biden's favor over the past several weeks. Uh, a lot of people have pointed to the March 7 State of the Union address where we saw some, some of that feistiness from Biden. We saw him take on Trump and the Republicans in a more direct way. And it put to bed for some voters questions about his age. He was very energetic, to, very energetic. He was ready to mix it up with Repu Republicans. And he's been on the campaign trail uh, pretty heavily over the past several weeks while Trump has been uh, in, in his uh, golf club in Mar-a-Lago doing less campaigning and dealing with his legal issues. And so uh, the Democrats feel that that once it becomes a binary choice between Trump and Biden, that the polling will increase in Biden's favor, that people will make the choice to vote for Biden. And they believe that they're starting to see some of that enthusiasm uh, now. Now, we do have uh, you know, the, the, the very likely uh, possibility that Trump is a formidable contender. This is going to be a close race, all the Biden advisors say, and Trump could still win. He could still uh, be the next president. And so they are not taking any of this for granted. They're not resting on their laurel laurels. Uh, Biden is actually holding uh, a campaign briefing today where he's going to be getting a briefing on all the latest polling and the path to victory. And so the Biden campaign is very aware that they are the last thing standing between the country and Donald Trump. And that is a high responsibility. And so they are trying to raise as much money and run a campaign that shows that they know the stakes of the election. Uh, and in November, we'll see uh, what, uh, what the voters decide. Mm -hmm. That CNBC poll also notes that um, Biden's appro overall approval rating rose to 39 percent from 35 percent in December, and his economic approval numbers rose to 37 uh, percent from 33 percent in December. I guess from the Biden campaign's perspective, 
Um, there's only one place to go but up. <laughs> Tulu Olorunipa, Pulitzer Prize winning White House Bureau Chief for The Washington Post. Thanks, as always, for coming to First Look. Have a good weekend. Thank you. You too. Time for the Opinions Roundtable. So let's go to the opinion side of The Washington Post, where we will find Washington Post columnist Ramesh Punuru, you see at top, and Jennifer Rubin, you see underneath in our Brady Bunch boxes. Uh, Jennifer, Ramesh, welcome back to First Look. Thank Great you. to be here. Um, so without question, President Biden has had a good march from the State of the Union address to the fundraising advantage to the cash on hand advantage that he maintains right now over uh, Donald Trump. Even Democratic hand wringing and bed wetting has stopped. But will it last? Ramesh, you go first. So I do think that uh, Biden is showing some real advantages and, and making a difference uh, here. I think that uh, the big event with the two previous Democratic presidents was a useful base unifying of moment, a uh, kind of moment for Democrats to say all hands on deck and whatever qualms Democrats may have about his age or his policy in the Middle East. He's the nominee and Trump is the alternative and, and it's time to get behind him. Um, I also think that money is possibly could make a real difference insofar as we've also got a change where the Republicans are relying more than they used to on irregular or low propensity voters, people who don't necessarily show up every election. That means you need to invest and get out the vote and it sounds as though the Democrats are going to have a lot more of that kind of money than the Republicans are. Jennifer, what do you think? Well, um, first of all, as you know, I don't think a lot about polls. And I just want to stress that the polls were within the margin of error before, and they're still within the margin of error. Right. So putting polls aside for a moment, um, I think President Biden is demonstrating um, that he Everyone knows he's old, um, he is old, but that he's more than capable of not only conducting a vigorous campaign, but governing the country. And one big difference and one reason why I think he's rising in the poll is we've seen more of Donald Trump. Every time Donald Trump uses up the oxygen in the room and demonstrates how nuts he is, lashing out at a judge's child, for example, um, ranting and raving, showing that he really does believe in these somewhat fascistic views. I think people remind themselves that, oh yeah, Donald Trump is kind of a bad guy. We don't want to vote for him. So in some ways, the more Donald Trump is out there, the better Biden does. And I would say one other thing. I think for Biden, um, if there is something to be said about his sense of almost destiny, that he believes he is the only one to beat Donald Trump, that he believes he's the only one who has beaten Donald Trump and he can do it again. And so you see this cockiness, this confidence, sometimes uh, some profanity from him. And <laughs> Democrats like that. They like to see a little spark, a little life. Um, so I think they're feeling much better. We've got months and months to go. There are going to be a zillion events between now and Election Day, including the trial of Donald Trump beginning in uh, April. Um, so we'll have to see how things go. But uh, it's certainly a uh, salve to the uh, nerves of Democrats who were uh, pulling their hair out a month or so ago. Yeah, the, the Democrats like the fight. They feel like uh, President Biden and the administration and the campaign have been fighting uh, aggressively enough from, from their perspective. And also, the Trump trial that you mentioned, uh, Jennifer, I think is, I, I don't know if it's, if ironic is the right word, but the fact that it's starting on April 15th, <laughs> tax day, is, yes, um, and, is so rich. No pun intended. Yeah, and, you know, one of the, the charges is that he falsified documents in furtherance of tax crimes. So that's just a little exclamation point on um, the irony, as you put it. So, um, Ramesh, you, you wrote a column this week um, with the headline, it's okay to oppose Trump without endorsing mm -hmm. Biden. Uh, and you wrote this fabulous line, Trump's biography is very nearly a compendium of the seven deadly sins. <laughs> it's just, it's such a great line, Ramesh. So why, here's my question, and it's a great line because I'm just wondering why are evangelicals 
behind, like full square behind a thrice married pay a porn mm. star to stay quiet about their dalliance guy who is now selling Bibles for $60. And it's Easter week. <laughs> Please explain if you yeah. can. Well, I think that uh, this, I think something that's happened here, and it's not just evangelicals, but a lot of Trump supporters, um, they came up with, I shouldn't say they came up with, they had reasons for supporting Trump in 2016 over Hillary Clinton based on issues like their views on religious freedom or their views on abortion. And then I think that a lot of what you heard back then was people saying, look, I understand that he's, he's a terribly flawed candidate not somebody I view as a role model for my kids, et cetera, et cetera. But I just, given these bad alternatives, I'm choosing him. But then once you've done that, I think it becomes very, very hard to keep those flaws in mind and mm -hmm. that the power of rationalization then often kicks in and you start telling yourself, well, he's not that bad and his opponents are worse. And, you know, this is really unfair. And actually, I don't even really want to hear criticisms of him anymore over time. And I think that something of that dynamic really uh, took effect for a lot of people. So Jennifer, you had a column um, uh, this week about Vice President Harris being tasked to court younger uh, and voters of color. What's behind that move? Well, I think they have found her strength. And even before this, I think she really kind of came into her own when she made Dobbs and the abortion issue, maybe her most, um, I think, uh, important uh, priority. And she speaks about this with passion. She speaks about this from a position of um, authority as a former prosecutor, having dealt with sexual abuse and rape victims. Um, so I think she is comfortable. That's in her wheelhouse. And so when she goes out and she talks about these issues and other issues that young voters are concerned about, she really is, um, I think, uh, at a greater level of confidence and effectiveness. We've seen her do these college tours. I think she's going to keep that up. I think um, there is repair work for Biden to do um, with younger voters and uh, even with some voters of color. So she's a very helpful surrogate in that uh, regard. And I think you've also seen her be used um, in the foreign policy realm. Um, she has been uh, voicing the more critical line of Israel, if you will, that the administration has adopted, which is of concern to these same uh, base voters. I think you're going to see more of her. I think she's been remarkable remarkably effective um, in this role as kind of the prosecutor of Trump in chief, um, which is a perfect role for the former prosecutor. Right. Former attorney general of California, former district attorney of San Francisco. Ramesh, let me come back to um, your column with the headline, it's okay to oppose Trump without endorsing Biden. Sure. Um, in, the, in the context of, of the third party conversation, um, it's fueled by a number of people who are disenchanted by the Biden-Trump rematch. In your column, you had advice for folks who, didn't, who don't like Trump or Biden. What's your advice on how they should cast their ballot? Yeah, so I think that, look, I mean, it's going to depend a lot on, this is a broad group of people, the people who have unfavorable views of both candidates, and there's diversity among them. And some of them are going to end up prioritizing the issues that make them pick Biden over Trump. Some of them are gonna go the other way. I, uh, in the last two elections, uh, my view um, was that neither of these candidates met the uh, threshold of acceptability. And I think it's perfectly fine to vote for a third party candidate or write somebody in if that's your view. So I'm telling people, look, I think there's rational reasons for people to, to vote one way or another. But I also think that uh, people shouldn't be sort of browbeat into this idea that the, you have to pick one of the top two candidates. Because there's no reason you, you there's an, I don't think there's any moral obligation. There's certainly no legal obligation that you have to do that. I'm just, I'm writing down browbeat. I, I, I'm going to let that, I'm going to let that just hang, <laughs> hang out Nothing there. I think you would ever browbeat anyone, Jonathan. No, 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 no. I never would. Uh, so Jennifer, I would love to get your view on, on third party candidacies and particularly Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Um, naming tech lawyer and mega donor Nicole Shanahan as his running mate. And now that he has chosen his, now that there's a team, the, the Kennedy Shanahan ticket, who should be more concerned about this ticket? Should it be 
the Biden campaign or should it be the Trump campaign? You know, it's very hard to tell. I think some Democrats still haven't figured out that he's not a Kennedy in the sense of the um, previous generation that was quite progressive and was not um, a lunatic uh, fringe candidate. So I think it's hard to say when people actually figure out who he is, who he's going to appeal to. But I want to take, um, with due respect to Ramesh, a very strong uh, difference of opinion on the third candidate and on um, not voting against Donald Trump. There are two candidates who are in a position to win, only two. None of the other candidates are going to win. And unless, and this is true around the world, unless the pro-democracy coalition that runs from center right to far left unites against an authoritarian nationalistic candidate, they will be in trouble. Donald Trump has a ceiling of about 46, 47 percent of the vote. Mitt Romney um, was the high earner for Republicans since George uh, uh, W. Bush in 2004. If Biden cannot get more than 46 or 47 percent of the vote, Donald Trump will be the next president of the United States, and that will be disastrous. So every vote that goes to another candidate does not go to Joe Biden and increases the chances that Donald Trump will be president. Now, if you really believe these are two equally bad choices, I guess it doesn't matter. For me, Donald Trump's election would be a disaster for democracy, not only here, but around the world, a disaster for the rule of law. We would be empowering someone who has already said he wanted to be a dictator. So I don't think that people who um, feel that Joe Biden really just hasn't mustered up um, to their standards um, should consider one of these candidates. Let's grow up. There really are only two choices, and you're either for a pro-democracy candidate or you're not. It's that simple. Ramesh, do you have a cool. rebuttal to the counselor's <laughs> argument? So I, I, I think that that's the kind of argument that you get around every election, but it runs up on the shoals of the fact that, you know, my voting for Biden or Trump or somebody else is going to have zero material effect on how Virginia goes. Virginia is going to vote for Biden. Other, you know, it's and, and the question is, does Biden have to win Virginia with my support? Uh, I can't control who's going to win Virginia. I can control whether um, this person wins with my support or not. Okay. Um, the Washington Post broke the story that former New Jersey governor and former Republican presidential candidate Chris Christie has decided not to run for president on the no label on the the no labels um, ballot line assuming that they actually get on a ballot line um, what does this say about the appeal of third party candidates in general and no labels in particular Jennifer um, well, first of all, I'm very glad that Ramesh is not giving that advice to people who live in Wisconsin and other swing states, because <laughs> those states really do make a difference. If you want to simply say, well, uh, my vote doesn't make a difference. Well, I live in Washington, D.C., so I really don't make a difference. <laughs> um, but with regard to no labels, um, they have a no candidate problem. A whole series of people who have said no thank you, um, going from everyone from Joe Manchin to Mitt Romney to uh, Nikki Haley, uh, they can't get anyone. And there's a reason for that. Um, and that is they have no chance to win. And anyone who thinks of themselves as a pol politician with a future doesn't want to go out with a humiliating loss. And moreover, they don't want to be a spoiler. The, uh, these are all people, for one reason or another, who acknowledge Trump is dangerous. And they don't want to play this role of attracting votes that might otherwise go to getting Biden above the 46, 47% uh, mark. So, so they are really, uh, I think, desperate at this point. Uh, it seems um, that they are simply going down the list. And what was interesting about Chris Christie's announcement was he said he did the research. He looked at the numbers and he came to the conclusion that they can't win. And so rather than simply saying, no, thank you, I think his statement um, which really backs up um, many of the critics of no labels, may deter other candidates. I don't know whether they're ever going to come up with someone. And at some point, if you come up with someone who is so obscure, it almost doesn't make a difference. Um, I think at this point, RFK Jr. is going to get more votes um, if you come up with Joe Blow for uh, no, the no labels candidate. Um, we've got about five minutes left, and I want to squeeze in a conversation 
about the the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in in um, Maryland, in Baltimore. Ramesh, um, the nation watched the horrifying images of that bridge coming down in the early morning hours of Tuesday in Baltimore Harbor. And just as quickly, countless conspiracy theorists took to Twitter, now known as X, to voice all sorts of theories, including claims that, quote, DEI did this, in the words of a Republican congressional candidate in Florida. The mayor is black. The Maryland port commissioner is black. The governor of Maryland is black. What exactly are Republicans trying to say, Ramesh? Yeah, I mean, it would be sort of surprising if at this stage, um, given how many African Americans there are in Maryland and Baltimore, there weren't um, representation in political leadership in, in these places. Uh, and I think, look, you know, there, there are legitimate arguments about um, DEI and how government and how policymakers should handle race. Um, but then some people use it purely as a stocking horse for racism. And I think that's what we're seeing. When, uh, when people leap to this kind of wild conclusion um, that it has something to do with what was actually, I think, just a freak accident um, of a kind that, act that didn't have a ton of policy implications one way or another. Um, I think too many Republicans have indulged in that. Uh, I don't think most Republicans have, but I also think that the Republicans who haven't, um, to the extent that this makes noise, need to repudiate and denounce it. Um, Jennifer would love would love your your thought. Well, I certainly agree. This is just abject racism, and I also want to take a moment to recognize that a number of people lost their lives. These were the workers who were out um, in the early morning hours, and I think we do have to recognize that immigrants do um, very difficult, very hard work. Um, some of this work is dangerous, and we should acknowledge their contribution. And there are families that are grieving. So um, Americans, I know, hold them close to their hearts and um, feel for the families. So um, let's not forget about them either. Yeah, great, great point, Jennifer. Thank you for that. And one more thing. In New Jersey, Republican Congressman Jeff Van Drew accused Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg of playing politics by visiting Baltimore the day of the bridge collapse while he didn't visit the site of a serious train derailment in Ohio last year until three weeks after the crash. Van Drew said, and I quote, well, it's an election year. Denver, is that a fair criticism? Well, it doesn't make any sense because Maryland, of course, is is not a swing state. It's not like they need Maryland. Um, so I do think, however, having nothing to do with um, the merits of um, a political strategy, that in staying away from uh, Palestine, uh, Ohio. Um, Buttigieg had very good reasons for it. It was a mess. He didn't want to uh, detract from the uh, rescue efforts, from the cleanup efforts, that he realized that it really does make a difference when you show up. Um, and he was criticized for that. I think he's learned that. Um, I think he shows up uh, regularly now to many, many uh, of these incidents. And so I think uh, you got to give him credit for having learned the lesson. Um, it may not, um, in reality, make all that much difference, but it makes a tremendous difference to people to see that the federal government is so engaged. And you actually saw President Biden um, make uh, an appearance that day, that morning, um, to speak about it. It shows you how important um, they think it is when the president um, personally engages and reaches out and provides solace to a community that's been devastated by a terrible event. Ramesh, last word to you, your reaction. Yeah, I think that this is, this is politics 101. I mean, often um, a leader visiting a place is going to be disruptive, particularly at a time when a lot of other things have to be happening. Uh, but people do appreciate it, and it's and of course it's just an attack line if you don't go. Right, Jennifer Rubin, Ramesh Panuru, as always, thank you very much for coming to First Look. Have a good weekend. You too. Thank you. Today marks 365 days, exactly one year since Wall Street Journal reporter Evan Gershkovich was detained in Russia. His crime, journalism. This is a photo, that was a photo released of uh, Evan on Tuesday in Moscow. Um, and we have Austin Tice in our thoughts. 
a journalist who worked for several news organizations, including the Washington Post, who was captured in Syria in 2012. For more of these important conversations, sign up for a Washington Post subscription. Get a free trial by visiting WashingtonPost.com slash live. That's WashingtonPost, all one word, dot com slash live. I'm Jonathan Capehart. Thanks for watching Washington Post Live's First Look.